In January 1769, HMS Endeavour sailed the endless expanse of the Pacific Ocean on a mission to explore the world and expand the state of scientific knowledge. Her crew would be among the first explorers to be ordered to sail the oceans in the name of science. But England was a colonial power and had other covert aims. Only the captain would be aware of them. The commander of this three-masted bark was James Cook, the Navy's best navigator. The Endeavour's first destination was to a paradise in the South Seas. The British Admiral, the sturdy vessel, was fully equipped with the latest scientific instruments and had supplies to last three years. The leader of this expedition, the 40-year-old son of a farmhand and an accomplished mathematician, was to become a world-famous explorer. The Endeavour sailed from England on the 8th of August, 1768, exploring latitudes never previously visited by a European vessel. Over the course of three voyages, Cook sailed tens of thousands of miles over a period of 10 years. With a crew of 94 men on board, including scientists and artists, this expedition into the unknown was driven by the desire for knowledge at a time when Europe was striving to free itself from the age of dogma and prejudice. It was the beginning of the technical era, the age of enlightenment. The captain had to be more than just a navigator. He had to be an engineer, a scientist, in fact. On the 27th of January, 1769, under hazardous conditions, the Endeavour rounded Cape Horn, the southernmost point of South America, where the water mass of the Atlantic collides with the Pacific Ocean. Few sailors before him had accomplished this journey. But what was the secret mission that sent Cook into these oceans? It was a fantastic plan that seemed almost as impossible as colonizing the stars. Unlike his crew, he was not searching for the Garden of Eden, nor was he interested in the legendary Island of Love. Every man on board ship knew the story of Captain Wallace, who was the first European to visit Tahiti just over a year earlier. On its discovery, he immediately concluded he had reached paradise. Since then, sailors wallowed in tales of South Sea beauties who were generous with their many charms. Cook's secret orders were to discover a huge unknown land, Terra Australis Incognita, a vast southern continent which was believed to extend as far as the South Pole. It was thought that 50 million people lived there and that there were plentiful resources of silk, spices, pearls and gold. Cook was the only man who could be entrusted with the task of finding the legendary land and claiming it for England. Accompanying Cook was Sir Joseph Banks of the Royal Society, a leading scientist who had personally invested 10,000 pounds in the expedition. The pressure to obtain results was enormous, particularly for Cook. Never before had there been such a large-scale scientific expedition. 16,000 kilometers and 352 days had elapsed since Cook and the crew of the Endeavour had left England. On the 10th of April, 1769, typical Polynesian boats met the Endeavour. Mountains became apparent from behind a huge cloud, like a vision from the Bible. Every man on board breathed a sigh of relief. Land at last. Three days later, the Endeavour had approached the north coast of Tahiti. The ship dropped anchor at the threshold of the paradise they had dreamt of. 
hundreds of boats surrounded the ship, packed with people who were eager to extend a friendly greeting. Although Cook and his men were not the first foreigners to set foot on Tahiti, the natives were fascinated by the very sight of them. For their part, the Europeans were amazed by this mysterious world with its echoes of paradise. The islanders greeted their guests with branches of the Pisang tree, a symbol of peace. Cook's highly cosmopolitan attitude and forward thinking was the key factor in winning the hearts of the Tahitians. They sensed that this man respected them and their culture, irrespective of skin color and customs. This was during a period when thousands of slaves were being transported from Africa to the Americas. On his second voyage around the world, Cook would come to be on good terms with a young priest called Omai, who accompanied Cook on journeys to other islands. Cook obtained insights into Polynesian culture that had never before been made available to a stranger. He was showered with gifts, many of which can still be seen and admired today in the museums of Europe. A stuffed iiwi, a tree dweller from Hawaii. Its feathers are used to make valuable helmets for war heroes and nobles. The drawings and artifacts Cook brought back from his voyages continue to provide valuable scientific information. Omai was able to provide Cook with Polynesian myths and legends, but knew nothing of the existence of the southern continent called Terra Australis. Later, Cook would return to England with Omai, where he would mix in the best society and even attended a number of balls. However, London's smog-filled air did not suit the Polynesian, and so he returned to his homeland. Polynesian life was very different from the Puritan atmosphere of 18th century England. Central to its culture was the natives' ability to express themselves through their music and dance. Often provocative and sexually arousing, the artists recorded the exotic way of life avidly. Cook never lost sight of his mission. His instructions to his men were clear. He wrote, in addition to our cartographic and scientific duties, we must also study the culture of the native inhabitants. In compiling over 1,400 documents and sketches to illustrate the beauty and peculiarity of Polynesian culture, a large audience throughout Europe would relive the adventure of Cook's expeditions in years to follow. Cook made detailed observations as he attempted to understand this alien world without causing disruption. He insisted that his crew maintain friendly relations at all times with the Tahitians, treating them with every courtesy. Cook's humanitarian attitude was completely new. Previous encounters with foreign cultures resulted in looting and violence. Now, curiosity was the ruling factor. The curiosity was reciprocated. Cook angrily noted, they will cheerfully steal everything that is not nailed down. The man with humanitarian values was plagued by terrible visions. How would the sailors behave in this place, which must have appeared like paradise to them? In fact, the men of the endeavor were delighted by the incredibly beautiful world they had found. Contented, Cook and his scientists were able to apply themselves to their next mission. You are to make a study of the animals and birds that reside there or are frequent visitors to that place. You are to investigate the composition of the soil and its properties. Should you find any evidence of raw materials, minerals or valuable stones, you are to bring samples of them home with you. Never before had a scientific expedition set sail with better resources and equipment. The aim of the scientists was to discover the mysteries governing the great world order. It was felt that mankind could understand creation by observing nature, gathering scientific data, and classifying life itself.
the European natural scientists were able to pursue their search for knowledge to their heart's content. Seventy years later, Darwin would return to these islands to work on his theory of natural selection, the concept that species gradually develop distinct identities from one common ancestor. Since the rehabilitation of Galileo and the abolition of the Inquisition, curiosity was no longer a deadly sin. The scientists worked in the ship's large laboratory from the early hours to late at night, with breaks only for meals, except when the seas were rough. Back in London, the Admiralty and the Royal Society were expecting concrete results. As well as large amounts of clothing and jewelry, musical instruments and tools, the scientists took back an incredible number of previously unknown species of insects, plants, fishes and birds. The animals were painstakingly stuffed and preserved and hundreds of plants were gathered and catalogued in minutest detail. The man who was in charge of these scientific discoveries was the young Joseph Banks. The scientific artists made precise studies of all the new plants and animals that were found, whilst still fresh. These artists produced portraits of flora and fauna that have almost photographic precision. Thousands of sketches and pictures were created and bequeathed to future generations. Cook was surprised initially to find his scientists collecting worthless plants with such enthusiasm. But over the course of his journeys, he too would become an expert on natural science. On Tahiti, the crew of the Endeavour found their paradise on Earth and all its delights. Captain Cook, it seems, resisted all carnal temptations. The Frenchman Bougainville wrote, these people know no other god except love. Each day is dedicated to love and the entire island is a temple. All the women are priestesses, all men are their worshippers. Cook's liberal attitude towards his crew paid off. During all his voyages, there was never a mutiny on board any of his ships. While his crew immersed themselves in sexual adventures, Cook formed relations of a political nature. He welcomed the king of the island on board the Endeavour. Captain Cook's account spoke of a very entertaining encounter with the king of Tahiti, who behaved most graciously towards his European visitor. With large quantities of sweet Madeira wine consumed, the evening was a success. Now that cordial relations had been placed on an official level, Cook was able to perform one of his most important tasks. His mission around the world was in part an astrological one. He was one of the members involved in the first pan-European scientific project designed to make voyages at sea less dangerous. Navigation on the high seas in the 1760s was not an exact science. A slight miscalculation of longitude could send vessels miles off course. The Earth turns 360 degrees in 24 hours, 15 degrees in one hour. 
Therefore, when it is exactly 12 noon at Greenwich in London, if it is 11 o'clock on board a ship at sea, then that ship must be 15 degrees to the west of the Greenwich meridian. Similarly, if there is two hours difference, the ship is 30 degrees away, three hours, 45 degrees, and so on. However, if the ship's clock is just one minute slow or fast, then the calculation of the ship's position will be 60 miles out. Such errors caused a great many disasters at sea. Since there were no accurate ship's chronometers at this time, the plan was to solve the problem astrologically. The Venus Project would measure the transit of Venus across the Sun from various places around the world. Cook's astronomer Charles Green had a portable observatory set up on the peninsula. Pendulum clocks ensured that the measurements were accurate to a matter of seconds. This project was so important that Cook had a fort of canvas erected to protect the valuable equipment. In 1716, Edmund Haley had suggested that the distance between the Earth and the Sun could be calculated using the Venus method. On the 3rd of June, 1769, Cook noted the times when the planet Venus began to pass in front of the Sun and when it moved away. 160 astronomers from nine nations stationed all over the world were involved in the Venus project. Not until years later, when all the results had been brought back to Europe, would it be possible to compare the figures. The distance between the Earth and the Sun is 150 million kilometers. Impressed by the Polynesian seafaring skills, Cook realized that the native sailors had their own method of navigation using the stars. He studied their brilliant shipbuilding methods, making drawings and sketches to provide comparisons with European vessels. The large, long-distance canoes resembled catamarans. These boats, constructed with the simplest of tools, could travel at 20 knots, twice as fast as the Endeavour. With the addition of their twin hulls, they were stable and had considerable storage space. On one of his observations, Cook watched the departure of a huge fleet of warships. 160 vessels with lavish decoration, they contained over 7,000 warriors. The aim of the crew was to do battle with the inhabitants of the next island, Bora Bora. Cook noted that on first sight, the islands appeared idyllic, but they were often at war with one another. Chieftains were always trying to extend their sphere of influence and subjugate their neighbors, which entailed large-scale acts of violence. The mass migration of the Polynesians began 3,000 years ago. Over many centuries, the long journeying sailors, as they were called, gradually settled on more than 1,000 Pacific islands, an area as big as the surface of the moon. The seafarers left nothing to chance. Only women who had already given birth, thus proving themselves capable of bearing children, were taken along. This was to guarantee that the tribe would be preserved in their new, distant home. Boats were loaded with fruits, shoots, and seeds. Tools and fish hooks were packed to ensure a supply of fresh fish. In terms of nutrition, the islanders were far more advanced than later seafarers. But how were they to navigate? During the day, the sun guided them. They also observed wave patterns, the flight of seabirds, and cloud formation. The Polynesians first sailed from Southeast Asia to Tahiti, then to Easter Island in the Southeast, to Hawaii in the North, and finally 
to New Zealand in the southwest. It was a massive exodus that lasted until 1200 AD. At night, the Polynesians navigated by what they called the Star Paths. Using the Southern Cross as a fixed point, the navigator could find his way by observing the changing stellar constellations. The orbits of over 150 stars were passed on from generation to generation by word of mouth. They knew precisely when a star would be visible above a certain island. Once the guiding star climbed too high in the sky, the helmsman would navigate by means of the following star. These nomads of the sea covered immense distances in their boats. From Tahiti to Hawaii is a distance of 5,000 kilometers. It is 4,000 kilometers to Easter Island and 5,000 kilometers to New Zealand. Considering the incredible size of the Pacific, the bold Polynesian explorers had to be admired. The islanders employed mysterious bar charts for navigational purposes. Grids on the charts formed a simple system of coordinates. Short bars represented currents. Curved lines indicated swells. Cook's reports from the South Seas were eagerly devoured in the salons of Europe. This newly found interest in foreign peoples and cultures would have an enormous influence on art, literature, and social sciences. A general inclination to return to nature was to spread across Europe, a transfigured world. But the reality was quite different. Thirty years after Cook, the magical culture of Polynesia began to be lost forever due to the arrival of unscrupulous adventurers and whalers. Missionaries obsessed with their task would force the natives to abandon their carefree and natural existences. The great powers would carve up Polynesia. Almost 200 years after Cook, the French would test atomic bombs on Mururua Atoll. But the myth of a paradise in the South Seas lives on to this very day. In August 1769, compelled by secret orders from the Admiralty, Cook left the islands. You will sail southwards and search for the southern continent, mentioned in confidence for as long as possible. By this act, you will increase the nation's prestige as a naval power, pay homage to the throne of Great Britain, and help promote her trade and nautical presence. The ship sailed off on her voyage to New Zealand and Australia, under the star of the Southern Cross. The mission was not an easy one for the ambitious captain. Employing a highly systematic and efficient method, he surveyed the huge, unexplored ocean. The only accounts which were available to Cook referred to a few stretches of coastline. One of these had been found by a Dutch seafarer who had called it New Zealand.
As Captain Cook's endeavor sailed westwards, nobody on board knew whether he would ever see his homeland again. Later that same year, Cook's lookout reported sightings of huge unknown objects. They were the whales of the South Seas. The crew believed they were approaching the mysterious Terra Australis Incognita. Then suddenly, rowing boats came into view, each carrying 40 people of an unfamiliar race. Later, Cook would hear of their legends. Whilst they searched for new hunting grounds in the vast expanse of the ocean, the Endeavour and her crew were overcome by despair. However, they were encouraged by the appearance of dolphins and whales that led them to an unknown island. Would they indicate the path to this legendary continent? In September 1769, the Endeavour reached the 40th parallel. Driftwood and seagrass floated past the ship. Land was in sight. Would it turn out to be the continent they were searching for, Terra Australis Incognita? The strange boats became more apparent. Cook recognized the language of the natives of Tahiti, 5,000 kilometers away. He was amazed to find the Polynesians had spread over such a huge area. Here, the English sailors were unlikely to receive a warm welcome. These wild oarsmen called themselves Maori, meaning the people. A thousand years earlier, hundreds of rowing boats had set off from Polynesia heading south. The experienced pilots navigated the boats across huge distances through hazardous conditions, singing martial songs to keep their spirits high. The Maori were to settle on an island kingdom packed with natural wonders and wondrous creatures, with a plentiful supply of food, a land with clear rivers and huge forests. They called the land the land of the white clouds. It was more rugged than the islands of bliss. Cook was the first European to set foot on New Zealand. The first contact with the Maori was not friendly. The haka dance and the outstretched tongue were intended to frighten off the Maori's enemies. Only later did Cook realize that the wild tribe's warlike dance was also a form of greeting. After a bloody battle, the Maori gradually returned to friendly relations, symbolized by the ritual rubbing of noses. The Europeans admired the artistic tattoos of the Maori, a typical South Sea practice that was later imitated in every port around the world. Cook was particularly occupied by the task of surveying at land and at sea. After sailing for 600 kilometers along the west coast, he made a startling discovery. He found and surveyed a long section of water, which is known today as Cook Strait. The passage led to the east coast of New Zealand. The existence of New Zealand's North Island had been established. But what was the country stretching away to the south? Sailing south, Cook charted each cape and bay along the east coast of New Zealand's South Island. Although he had not found the southern continent, he had proved that New Zealand consisted of two islands. Even today, his work in surveying the North and South Islands is considered a masterpiece in map making. Cook had many ideas on how this new land could be developed. He noted the rivers and promontories could provide plentiful food supplies and that the land was rich in fresh water, grass and timber. The warlike Maori fascinated Cook. One day, the men of the Endeavour made a gruesome discovery. In his usual calm manner, Cook's diary entry read, in almost every bay where we ventured ashore, we found human bones near the sites of campfires. Cook had always suspected that there were cannibals in the South Seas. 
During the voyage, a sailor was taken prisoner and eaten. Cook made no attempt to take revenge. In the 1700s, nothing grabbed the attention of both travelers and non-travelers alike as stories of cannibalism. Cook had discovered some of the Polynesians' religious sites. As well as animals, human beings, both prisoners and slaves, were sacrificed. Anthropologists confirmed that cannibalism was actually practiced, not to provide food, but because of religious reasons. Cook was invited to one of the gruesome rituals. He observed that the dead person was not completely eaten. The Maori believed that the gods would be satisfied with symbolic gestures of eating. In this way, the chieftains and priests gained some of the strength and power of the defeated opponents, their mana. Cook's accounts of these sinister events were as dispassionate as any anthropologists. For six months, the endeavor sailed around the islands that composed New Zealand. After two years at sea, there were few men on board who would not prefer to return home. However, instead of setting a course for the Cape of Good Hope, the endeavor sailed westwards along the 40th parallel. Cook knew there was a land of some sort ahead, though only part of it had been charted by a Dutch seafarer who named it New Holland. But the east coast had not been surveyed until this point. Cook intended to find it and to claim the land for the British crown. However, danger lurked for ships and their crews in the uncharted waters off the coast of this fifth continent, the land today known as the east coast of Australia. It was almost a complete disaster. The endeavor ran aground on a reef. Cook was incredibly fortunate. The ship hadn't sunk and could be refloated. It took two months before the voyage could continue. First, Cook formally claimed the entire eastern coast of Australia for Britain. Thirty years later, the first ships from England arrived with convicts transported to Australia, the beginning of the end for Aborigine culture. Cook's attitude had changed. He was now subdued, oppressed by the burden of his secret orders. This land, New Holland, was not the southern continent he had been ordered to find. Bound by a sense of duty towards his king, in 1772 on his second voyage, Cook made a final, desperate attempt to find the legendary southern landmass. He sailed as far south as he could into completely unknown icy waters. Never before had a ship ventured so far south. Cook was the first person to enter the Antarctic Circle, discovering a desert of never ceasing coldness. Rewarded with a commander's commission, Cook's new ship, the Resolution, was threatened by floating islands composed entirely of ice. His diary described how the rigging completely iced up and how they ran out of food supplies. However, they were able to obtain plenty of fresh water by melting ice. His fanatical attempt to find the lost continent came to an abrupt end. Stopped by an endless barrier of ice, Cook was no longer able to make out the horizon. His discovery led him to believe there was nothing more at this point. Cook himself, never having believed in the mythical southern continent, felt he had finally proved once and for all that such a place did not exist. He wrote to King George in a firm and confident tone. If I failed to discover the continent, it was because it does not exist. It was as though he wanted to say, let that be an end to it. On the rare days without gales and hail, Cook's crew succeeded, though with immense difficulties, in making repairs to the bark's rigging. 
After this dangerous diversion into the land of eternal ice, the resolution changed course and headed north on a new mission. As the weather improved, so too did Cook's mood. The resolution visited the third point in the triangular area settled by the Polynesians. Easter Island was discovered by a Dutch seafarer one Easter Sunday. Cook only put ashore here once, primarily to obtain fresh drinking water and to secure food supplies. Once he had surveyed and mapped the island with customary precision, his men looked for forest areas where they might gather firewood. But earlier Polynesian immigrants had been there first. The men came across massive statues which gazed across the sea 4,000 kilometers to the east of Tahiti. Anthropologists who later studied the magnificent statues believed at first that they were the work of immigrants from South America. But then further excavations indicated that Easter Island was the eastern outpost of Polynesia. Aku Aku, the evil spirit of the island, now watches over nothing but soulless idols. Cook mapped out Easter Island for the British Admiralty before continuing on the greatest voyage of exploration of all time. In July 1776, Cook was sent on another expedition under the orders of King George. Cook's third and final voyage was intended to shed light on a geographical mystery. He hoped to find a northwest passage, which would drastically reduce the sailing time for merchant ships traveling from Europe to Asia. Cook was the best man for the job, but many experienced sailors had already failed in the search for a northwest passage. A number of ships had sunk with the loss of many lives. On one hunting expedition, his men succeeded in killing a dozen huge walruses. Cook tried to persuade his crew to eat the greasy meat, but even when he threatened them with punishment, he could hardly force any of the men to swallow the unappetizing food. After spending months in search of the Northwest Passage, Cook, like so many captains before him, admitted failure. It was a bitter blow for this ambitious navigator. His era appeared to be coming to an end. Cook was weakened by the ravages of disease and plagued by melancholy. On his 50th birthday, the new Columbus conceded defeat. No explorer had ever removed so many white spaces from the globe, surveyed so many coastlines and islands, or covered such immense distances. It was James Cook who laid the foundation for the ultimate mapping of the entire Earth's surface. The great age of discovery by sailing ships came to an end with him. Cook spent his whole life at sea and never spared himself his crews, or his ships. However, a curious atmosphere dominated his final expedition. A strange premonition gripped the ship. After months in the ice, Cook wanted to spend the winter in the Hawaiian archipelago before venturing any further. He sailed for the volcanic island of Hawaii, the greatest of his many discoveries, as he himself wrote. After 40 years at sea, Cook's energy as a seafarer appeared to be at an end. The natives interpreted the shining white sail of the approaching English ship as a special sign from the gods, and destiny took its course. Cook's reception on Hawaii was overwhelming. As chance would have it, a powerful god was expected to manifest itself from precisely the direction where Cook's ship appeared. It was the start of the annual festival in honor of Lono. The Hawaiians were eager to meet their beloved god, who had promised to bestow great gifts on his return.
Ethnologists today suspect that the natives really did think Cook was the god Lono, the god of peace, light, and plenty. For several weeks, Lono was more powerful than even the mighty god of war, Ku. Cook was worshipped and accompanied by priests wherever he went. Idols to Lono were erected in sacred groves around the island. There was no end to the ceremonies, paying homage to the man they thought was their god. When the Europeans landed on Hawaii, they encountered a deeply religious culture and superstitions dominated by experience of natural extremes. The powerful god Pele was believed to live inside the volcano. The tea flowers were of great significance. Hawaiians believed they offered protection from evil spirits and misfortunes. With their ritual dances and prayers, the natives of Hawaii attempted to placate the moody Pele, thus preventing a volcanic eruption. Sacrificial gifts, food or jewelry, were wrapped in leaves from this plant and placed at the edge of the crater or tossed into the volcano. They hoped that Pele would be merciful and accept the offerings. After two weeks of worship, the mood towards Cook suddenly changed. The reign of the false god came to an end. The natives no longer regarded Cook as a divine being. Arguments occurred. The English visitors had exhausted the hospitality offered to them. Cook was troubled by premonitions. In view of the mounting tension and mistrust, he had to make a decision that would save lives on both sides. The time had come for Cook to set sail. After only a few miles, the ship encountered very bad weather. The foremast was broken. Cook had no alternative but to return. However, the ship was now without the large square sail that was the symbol of Lono. The natives became fearful. Cook suspected his end was near. The Hawaiians believed after Cook had sailed away, the god of war, Ku, once more became the ruling deity. However, the sudden return of Lono caused panic and threatened to upset the mythical order of the Hawaiian religion. Cook's crew sensed that they were being forced to sail back into a very precarious situation. There was no room for two gods at the same time. The priests consulted oracles, and the reply of the gods was that they should wage war on the false god. The dances that had earlier been harmless now symbolized death and destruction. The chieftains wore kihulu, sacred helmets of feathers and animal teeth that were supposed to lend them additional strength. The atmosphere on the island became more and more hostile. Squabbles became fights. Pele sent powerful streams of lava shooting up out of the ground. The intruders were to be swallowed up by the molten lava from the divine volcano.
When a boat containing weapons was stolen from the English sailors one night, the situation escalated. Cook was beside himself with rage. With an escort of armed marines, he tried to force the return of the stolen boat. The once cautious and humane Cook now wanted to take the Hawaiian king hostage at gunpoint. The punishment for this was death. The argument developed into a vicious fight, but Cook remained firm. However, according to contemporary accounts, he turned away and a native warrior stabbed him in the back. Cook's sailors reported that he was killed with a dagger that he himself had presented to the warrior. The English took their furious revenge. An expedition intended to benefit mankind ended with cannons roaring. On the 13th of February, 1779, the great navigator died. In England, the hero of the seas was regarded as a martyr. His guiding star was Sulis, the wood of the cross. After his death, the crew made a gruesome discovery. Cook's body had been chopped up. His flesh and bones were distributed amongst the most powerful families on the island. Mana was a religious ritual, which brought about divine power and could only be received from the dead. For the Hawaiians, this was a great honor. For the Europeans, it was a bestial act by primitive savages. Legend has it that Cook's chronometer stopped forever on the day of his death. His thirst for exploration brought him great honor, but his death brought him immortal fame.